everyone. We love you. We thank you for your service. My goodness. In fact, if you, uh, wh whether you're active or no longer active, would you stand if you're one of our veterans in our community really quickly? Just, can you just stand really quickly? Thank you so much. Guys, can we just show them some love? Thank you so much for everything you do, everything you continue to do. Amen. Amen. So powerful. What an amazing video team. Thanks for putting those stories together. That was so awesome. And uh, it, it just gives you an appreciation for the things that we can so freely appreciate, doesn't it? I mean, it, it helps set in place. We were, I was emailed uh, earlier um, this, uh, it was either last week or something, and one of the, the uh, men on the video was like, I don't want us to ever forget things like Veterans Day or even things like Armistice Day, which was, is November 11th too, and that sort of signaled the end of World War I. And, and those things that are so important for us to remember because at great cost, at great effort, with great uh, strategy and all of the things that it required, uh, we are able to enjoy the things that we can. And um, I'm just so, uh, I, I don't want to take that for granted, amen? Like, like even this, NT Lane, thank you so much for making the lay this morning. Come on, she makes all that, the lays uh, for me. It's so good. Oh my gosh. Hey, well, this morning we continue in our series, Closer. Everybody say closer. 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 And basically the simple practices that draw us closer to God's heart. And so there are spiritual disciplines, there are practices, things that are ultimately going to draw us a little bit closer to God's heart and God's love for us. Last week, we talked about a rule of life. And those things that sort of uh, are anchoring us in priorities that will lead us through certain processes. Well, this morning, we're going to talk about the practice of simplicity. Everybody say simplicity. And everybody knows, most people know that, hey, simplicity may be simple, but it sure ain't easy. You know what I mean? I mean, trying to keep things simple is not as simple as it sounds. It requires a lot of energy sometimes. But I want to take a moment to appreciate some of the simple things that we get to experience. Don't really cost us much, but they sort of, they're sort of simple pleasures that we can appreciate every day. Like, like, I don't know why the simple things sort of get stuck in your mind and in your head, like that, that, that baby shark song that's going around. <laughs> baby shark, do, 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 do. Someone's like, stop, don't do it. Because it's going to be in my head all day long. That has gone so far. Why? The simplicity of it, it embeds itself in the deepest part of your subconscious. And then it comes out somewhere. Well, I hope that this would be better than that. You know what's very simple and I appreciate? Sleeping in on a rainy day. Come on. You guys like that? That's simple, right? How about finding money in your pocket? Come on. Anybody find money in their pocket this week? Nobody. I'm sorry. I found a dollar. You might as well told me I'm one a million, man. It was amazing. I got a dollar. Okay. Uh, how about getting an actual letter from someone in the mail? Okay, so young people, so a letter, this is what it is. It's a piece of paper, and you would write your thoughts and your feelings on it, and you'd put it on a piece, of, and then you'd send it in the mail, and then a year later, it would get to wherever you were supposed to go. Remember pen pals? So someone with thought and intention writing. That, there's a simple pleasure in that. How about making the yellow light? Oh, simple. But you're like, woo, yeah, it's going to be a good Monday. <laughs> the right song at the right time. Oh, that'll get you every time. Driving home from work, windows down. The song comes on from the mid to early 90s. And you're loving it. Maybe a little bit later. I don't know. What's your favorite song? Just pick a scenario, okay? Finding the perfect parking spot. That's real, Hawaii. Come on. That's real. You know, even the better one is the drive through parking spot. When you pulled in and you're like, oh, man. And then the one in front of you isn't open. And then you pull in front of there because now you don't have to back up. That's glory. That's glory. That's what that is. That's glory. How about a familiar smell? familiar smell, simple pleasures that really resonate with us. Maybe that's, that's grandma's house. Maybe that's that where, where you uh, went to college uh, years ago and you remember those things. How about fresh, clean sheets? Oh, I, somebody was like, ooh, I heard it. They, a verbal response. We're hitting things right now. Reminiscing about old times with really good friends. 
An unexpected compliment. Oh, that one's good. Unexpected. Free compliments. Hey, you look good today. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, wow. I didn't expect that, but thank you. Now my week is awesome, you know? Thank you. How about a good laugh? Come on, a good laugh. Simplicity is simple, but it's not easy oftentimes because even the things that we want, like these kinds of pleasures, these kinds of simple experiences, sometimes we want to get back to them, but it's hard sleeping in on a rainy day sometimes when you have all of the demands that now are affecting what you got to do inside your home, right? It's hard to enjoy a good laugh sometimes when you are so busy that you don't have time to enjoy a moment. And that's why I'm so thankful for, for Pastor Jay this morning. I don't know if you felt that. I think you did. There was something happened in worship. And I want to just recognize that when our young people lead us to the throne room in worship, that it's a good moment. Amen? Like when our young people, give it up for our young people leading worship. Because when we lead with our hearts yielded to Him, it's going to be good worship right? When we're not so worried about how, if, if we're sounding like Bruno Mars down at the Blaisdell, but we're worried about, are we, are we giving our hearts to Jesus? We're laying our crowns down. And Mari, I just want to say that was, a, that was a word from the Lord from us. I know you're somewhere around here, but that was a word from the Lord. <laughs> Family, I don't ever want us to not pay attention to a moment of worship that our young people are experiencing. Because it will often draw us into a deeper place of worship and experience ourselves. Amen? There's something powerful. But why is that so complicated? Well, it's because I think simple pleasures and simplicity is sometimes it's connected with times and seasons. And those things change. We, we think when, when things were simple when I wasn't married, things were simple when I didn't have kids, things were simple when we didn't have this mortgage, they were simple, they're connected with places or seasons of life, and we get frustrated because we want to go back there, but that season is over, and now what do we do? Uh, they're, they're competing oftentimes, that simple uh, value is often competing for a lot of space in our life. See, when we are entitled to every experience, we're entitled to everything. When everything is important, nothing is. Does that make sense? When everything demands all of your attention, then nothing ends up getting the best of your attention. And simple pleasures are often just remembered inaccurately. I don't know about you, but my memory, it's just like, it's just messed up. Like, I'll talk to my wife about a season of life. I'm like, man, it was simpler then. Man, wasn't it so awesome? And she's like, were we living in the same house together? That was so incredibly challenging and hard and difficult. What are you remembering? And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I thought it was awesome. I don't know. You know? I mean, didn't the Israelites do that? Didn't God's people do that when they came into the hard times and they're like, man, remember when we were in Egypt and we had all the meals and stuff? Yeah, and you were in slavery too, you know? Like we tend to misremember. It becomes spotty sometimes when we think about these things. When nature itself is pulling us towards chaos, it's pulling us towards entropy, it's like our soul is getting pulled in so many different directions away from its center. When the world around us with so many demands and things, it's literally a fight against nature to remain in a simple place of abundance in Christ. And so this morning, I want us to define simplicity. There's probably a, a hundred different ways that you could define it. This morning, I want to define it as this. Simplicity is the practice of determining what matters and deciding to live like it. The simple practice of determining what matters, what's important, what is a priority, and then simply deciding to live as if that thing, that person that value matters. And it sounds so good because I like doing that too. I, I decide. I'm a decider. We got deciders in the room. You're like, I, I, don't, I'm not, I am not indecisive. I'm decisive. I make decisions. I want butter on my toast and jam. I'm a decider. Aren't you impressed? 
You know what I mean? Like, like we want that. And yet, the moment that we decide that one thing matters more than another thing, it's immediately in competition, isn't it? Once we decide that this value matters more at this time than this value, they start fighting for your attention. When we decide that my value as a family competes with some of my other family members' values and their opinions about me, those things are now in conflict. Now there's a battle, there's a power struggle. When we decide to live simply, it requires some effort. Jesus had a conversation that powerfully, I think, highlights what we're going to be talking about this morning. We're looking mostly at the words of Jesus and drawing a principle of simplicity and a practice of that from Him. And you could look at the life of Jesus and see that it was fairly simple in, its, uh, in His possessions, in his, uh, what He valued. Ultimately, He just wanted to do what the Father told Him to do. But in Matthew 22, verse 34 and 36, it it says this, that the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply. So in this chapter, Jesus is being tested. Uh, He's at the press conference and everybody's firing away at questions and they want to trip him up. I don't know if you've ever been on the other end of the firing squad of questions meant entirely to try and trip you up. No, married couples, don't chicken wing it. Don't, don't be like, yeah, that was you. That was you. Like we've been in those places where people are firing questions off just to try and maybe get a rise out of us. This is what's happening. And they say this, an expert in the law tried to trap him with this question. Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Now, I, I, I like to, when I read the, the Word, and especially when I know the intent of the Scripture, I like to read it in the tone that I, that I think it's intended, right? Because this guy's not like, teacher, what do you think is the most important commandment? I picture him like a, like a weird Disney villain, you know? Teacher, what is the most important commandment? You know, like, like he's really trying to fish for some kind of, you know, trying to trap him. Jesus, he's already caught wise, man. He's already silenced his critic two other times. They said, hey, who should we pay taxes to? He said, look, dude, just pay taxes. If, if what you owe God, give to God. And what you owe Caesar, pay to Caesar. Boom. I love Jesus, man. Then they're like, hey, what about the resurrection? There's this guy and then this girl. They were married and then she marries and then all this stuff. He's like, you guys are complicating this way too much. In heaven, it's different than here. Why are you guys obsessed with dead things? God is the God of the living, not the dead. Ooh, clap back. I love it. And then they say, what's the greatest commandment? As if now Jesus is like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? This is what he says, and it's in your notes. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. This morning, we're going to take a look at some characteristics of the practice of simplicity See, the Pharisees had a way of making things complicated. Now, certainly in Deuteronomy, in those first five books of Moses, the books of the law, there were plenty of commandments. There was something like 365 positive, 200 and some odd negative. It adds up to around 613 commandments or rules or things to follow. And then on top of that, what you had is the Mishnah, which was the oral tradition. It was sort of their interpretation orally of what was written down. So the Pharisees didn't just have those, they had plenty more that they were following, and it started getting in the way. Now, it wasn't the intent of the heart. They didn't want to be so complex in their religious practice that they ended up further away from God. But what happened was they looked at the law and they said, this is why we're in the trouble we're in. This is why Rome is oppressing us. This is why our history is peppered with all of these terrible things is because we got away from God's law, His covenant. And in one sense, it was true. 
So it was like they built a fence around the things that would keep them unholy or that would keep uh, their, their correction from God, the judgment of God, from hitting them. Then they said this, let's build some more because if we have this safety net, let's create even more of a safety net. And so all of a sudden, they're doing things, they're placing burdens on people that they can't even fulfill. They're making things very complicated. And Jesus takes all 613, and he boils it down to the most essential. Like how, I, I wouldn't have known how to answer that question, but Jesus, he says, the two most important things, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. What is the most important? He says, on these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. On these two, all 613, look, you can feel this in your notes, that simplicity feels very complex. It feels complex when you're looking at a 613 rule problem, that looks very complex. How do I follow this when this seems to not connect with that? And trying to boil it down to something that I can live by can be challenging. But Jesus said, all of those, the other 611 laws... All of those hang. They are suspended. Literally, the picture is like something that is being suspended by two cords, like all of the weight, everything suspended. I went skydiving one time because my wife played a trick on me and it wasn't fun. And, and so I, you know, the scary part for me wasn't like launching out of the plane. That was crazy. That was wild. The even more scary part for me was as the chute opened up and I'm dangling in the expanse of the sky, realizing that I am only hanging and suspended in the air by like these little strappy things. <laughs> and then the guy that's strapped to my back, which was a very fun experience, it's like whispering in my ear, you know, he's there. And he says, hey, why don't you pull on this? And I'm just like, okay. And I yank him, and I'm like, ah! And I'm going all over the place. He's like, ha, 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 what fun. <laughs> My entire life is hanging suspended by these, these cords that apparently are like industrial strength, whatever. All of the law is suspended on these two commandments. Can you imagine how much that must have driven the Pharisees crazy? What do you mean? Jesus uses action words. He uses emotion words and reason words. And why is that? It's because we think we're, we're clear when we want to try and get simple, but it gets very complicated very fast. And the reason why is because our decisions are not always made logically. Like conclusions that we draw aren't always made because one plus one equals two. It's like one plus one plus that mean thing you said to me in kindergarten equals we never talk again. We make decisions based on emotion. And a lot of people think, well, I'm pretty cerebral, I'm pretty analytical. Yeah, and you are also a human being, and the decisions that we make are often rooted and tied in emotion. And Jesus doesn't shy away from that. He says, love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Everything about you is involved in this process. And the more time that we, we take making decisions, it seems like the more complicated things get, doesn't it? It's like the more time, it's like, ah, and, and then we get paralyzed sometimes. Too many options are paralyzing. Just give me one option and I'll choose it. You give me 15 and nobody moves. So we base oftentimes then what we decide is important, what our priority is on what other people would think or say. Then we have that group think, well, I'm going to decide because I think that this is what Pastor Pat would have said and it sounds like the right answer and so on and so forth. And then things get very complex. Look, in a world full of competing values, to decide the value between things will always feel more complicated, even when it is the most simple and necessary thing to do. And that's why we got to get essential. Get essential. You can write that down. Just get essential. What is removing the, un the unnecessary things so I can walk in simplicity? But it's not just removing everything. Somebody's like, man, you're telling me I don't have to do anything at all and my life will get simple? No. 
The answer isn't just that we do nothing at all, it's that what we do is the most essential thing. So last week we talked about a rule of life, only doing or saying what God has told us to do or say and how that would change our whole life. Well, in the same way, some of us may need to remove things in order to add better things. Some of us, and you're thinking, man, but my schedule's already overpacked. So then what we would say is, we would say, I would encourage, look, ask Jesus, what part of my life is not as essential? What can I say no to so that I can say yes to what you're actually asking me to do? Some of us are, 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 are maybe struggling because we're like, I'm stuck or I'm frustrated in my face, faith because we, are tr- we haven't added the most essential practice that he's told us to. When I feel stuck most of the time, it's because it's something hard that I have to choose to do and I haven't done it yet. Can anybody relate to that one? Sometimes there's that delayed obedience that really kind of makes things complicated and it's really not. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Simply say, yes, I will, or no, I want. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Simplicity, I'd say, embraces consistency. Jews, they're swearing by heaven and earth. They're they're making their promises sound really, really good. They're saying, ah, by heaven, I'll do this, or by the earth, this shall not happen. And Jesus is saying, what if we lived our life with such a degree of integrity that when I said no, you wouldn't ever have to question it? That when I said yes, you wouldn't need any other thing to assure you that I would follow through on my yes. It's very simple, isn't it? And yet, in order to be consistent in that, that is the challenge. That's the challenge. So be consistent. I think those words, the words of Jesus, the principle that we draw out is Jesus was someone whose yes was yes and whose no was no. So let's live in an attempt to draw like into Jesus' way of life, His pattern of life. Let's be consistent. What do I need to keep doing that I stopped doing? What have I stopped doing that I know? It it seems like the most simple thing, but I need to keep doing it. Look, uh, this, this next one, Jesus, right in front of Pilate, at the beginning of the whole crucifixion process, he says, so are you a king or what? That's what Pilate says. And Jesus answers, you say that I'm a king, but for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. You know what's amazing is as we look at Jesus and he, he makes things simple. He says the law really is summed up in this way. And he says that, that, that our, the way we live our life, not by promises, by religious clout, but by simplicity of integrity and, and the integrity of our own heart. Then he says this, when he is embroiled in the middle of like a political power struggle, he do, you see how he doesn't defend himself? He never defended himself. All he simply said was, I'm here because this is my purpose. And I think simplicity fights for clarity. I think simplicity fights for the clarity of knowing why I exist and why I'm here. When we don't have clarity of our purpose, things get very confusing because then we start paying attention to other people's assignments and other people's processes. But Jesus was not confused. In Matthew 5, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it completely. I've come that they would have life and have it abundantly, he says in John. In Luke, he says, I have come to seek and to save which was lost. And even at facing his own death, he says, this is why I have come. See, I think sometimes we think that the practice of simplicity is like somebody saying, well, what do you mean? Does that mean I have to avoid things that are complex? No. And that's the great tension, isn't it? In Christ, and he does it all the time, and it's, it's unfair for us. It feels unfair when he says, if you want your life, then lose it. What? You know, like, if you want that freedom, then, then you, have to, you have to let it go. And in the same way, simplicity and complexity often live, they're like next-door neighbors. 
But if you look at Jesus right in the midst of this, he, he's this guy from Galilee, and he's in front of the one guy that can set him free, Pilate, and he lets him know. He says, I could do anything right now if you just talk to me. He says, dude, you don't have any power except for what I have given you. That's what Jesus knows. And so he knows that by doing this, he is fulfilling his purpose. His, he was so clear on it, and so the value for saving his own life took a back seat to fulfilling his life's purpose and assignment. How simple, how powerful. He's in the midst of all of this political turmoil between Rome and the people, there's fights going on in-house between Pilate and his wife. She's saying, don't do it. He's saying, let me do what I need to do. The Jewish people and the leaders of the day are like, we got to kill this guy and get rid of him. Jesus is in all of the mix of this complexity, and yet he remains steadfast. It's for this purpose I have come, so I can remain clear when everything else is so chaotic. There's something powerful about that reality. So I would say, know your assignment. Know what God is asking you to do. Yes, know your, your identity as a son or a daughter of God. Know your calling, which is the same as my calling, regardless of where you are, to make disciples, to share God's love. But your assignment, that thing that you are currently in that is so frustrating right now, but you know you need to fulfill it, the career, the vocation that you're in, this assignment you've been given to live out your identity and your calling to share God's love. Know your assignment so that now we're not uh, getting jealous of someone else's assignment or success and we're not comparing someone else's failure with our own. The last thing I want to point out is in Philippians 4, 11 through 12, and, and now it's the words of Paul. And he says, not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing. Anybody have to grow up learning to live on almost nothing? Or with everything, I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or an empty, with plenty or with little. And so, yes, we're talking about contentment, but there is a simplicity involved when we are content with what God has given us. Give us this day our what? Our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Provide for me what I need in this moment. See, Paul could only trust God for whatever he was going to provide. We have to trust God for whatever we have. That's enough. That has to be enough. It takes us trusting God that whatever we lack is enough for God to provide for. That takes trust too. Reducing the law down to two rules freaked everybody out. <laughs> Why? Because grace. Grace is unsettling. What do you mean there's 613 and now you're narrowing it down to two? What are we going to do with that other law? Every scenario can be boiled down to, is this going to give glory to God? How do I think about it? How do I act in it? Is this scenario, is this situation, is this decision going to cause me to love others and to think more highly of others than myself? Yes, two laws that hang on, that everything hangs on will determine every other thing. And that's why I think simplicity requires trust and not control. Grace feels dangerous and we tend towards more. We think we got to do more and that ends up making it more complicated. Well, if a little discipline is good, then even more discipline is better, says the performer in the room, says the striver who always needs to feel like as long as we're doing more, then I am more. Some of us know what I'm talking about. God's grace is powerful proof that we actually have no control over God. Here's what it is. Sometimes, inadvertently, we start thinking we get to control God with our discipline and our faith. But God, I did A, B, and C. It's exactly what you told me to do. So now you have to do what I'm asking you to do. And God's like, <laughs> that's awesome. Let's try that. And you know, some of us were like, hey, I'm just going to speak for myself. I can be, I can tend. Look, if you've ever said this when people are like, man, you need to relax. Maybe you need to let go or stop being so controlling. My response is like, hey, look, I'm not controlling. I just like things in a particular order. 
I like things in a particular way. And here's how this manifests. And maybe this could be a test for you. How do you load the dishwasher? (laughs) Do you have a system? The fact that you would use a word like system to load a dishwasher means you might have a problem. I load the dishwasher with a system. My wife, just this week, she said, I open it up, I start rearranging things. She says, I already put the dishes in there, they're fine. I said, oh yes, no, and you did a fantastic job. It's just that we have new information now. We have new dishes, and they require a new configuration. And she says, you're a crazy person. And I say, do you want food on your dishes? And she says, whatever. I have a control issue. Uh, (laughs) Man, somebody else is taking their their laundry too serious. Somebody else is taking those dishes a little too serious as if the the success of your entire life is going to be determined by the order in which you keep your kitchen. And I'm saying it to myself as much as anybody else. Now, there's other people in the room, they're like, (laughs) man, those people are crazy because I don't care at all. And we'll learn from you, but you might need to learn from us too. (laughs) Look, I want you to ask the question, where is it hard to trust God today? Where is it hard to trust Him? And I I want you to write this down, two words, just let go. Where is it hard to trust Him? But Pat, I'm going to study more, and I'm going to pray more, and I'm going to do more. What if God was actually directing you to do less, and you had to trust? But I thought we're supposed to read in this way, and I'm supposed to engage with the Word. Yeah, but what if God actually put a limit on you, so it forced you to depend on Him to fill the gap? What if your simple act, your simple practice of only doing what God has asked you to do and what He tells you to do, it never feels like it's everything you have to do. Sometimes, it's, especially for people, it's like, if you're like me, it's like, that, that's it, no, I have to do more. And He says, you stick with that, you watch me fill the gap, that way I get credit and you don't. Where is it difficult to trust God? I want you to write it down. I want you to think about it, and I want you to pray it. And if you're brave, I want you to ask someone else who knows you, where does it look like it's hard for me to trust God? And that person's going to look at you and say, I've been waiting for this moment. For years. No, I'm not going to do that because they're better than that, okay? You're nice Christian people, okay? Keep it simple. Look, I I don't know necessarily how profound this message is, but I know in its practice, by pushing away all that can complicate at great effort oftentimes, at great cost what it feels like to us, when we get to the simple place of God's presence in our lives, it is so freeing, family. This week, I want to show a picture. I got to meet uh, Nick Vujicic this week, and that was really, really fun. Come on, you guys listen to Nick Vujicic this week. That was so awesome, man. Life without limbs, He's, he was born, no arms, no legs, and, um, and so I got to meet him, and my kids got to meet him as well, and so what was cool is that they, they saw him on the live stream, and they're like, they're asking a thousand questions, they're like, how, how does he, what is he, what is that? Well, how does he do, and how does he use the bathroom, and what does he do, and all this stuff, and I said, that's a great question, that's a great question, and then the next night I was like, you want to meet him, and they're like, uh. They were freaking out. So they met Nick, and then Nick is so great, he, he just kind of, the guy just picks him up and kind of puts him on the, on the sofa there, and then he's like, oh, kids, he's got this Australian accent, he says, come over and give me a hug, and my kids are like, oh, okay, and they give him a hug, and they're like stunned, they're like, what, how, and they had a bunch of questions, I said, guys, do you have any questions for Uncle Nick, and they were like, no, no. They got so intimidated, you know? As far as limbs, all that Nick has is that little foot. It's right by Mia's leg. And watching him walk around that table and just tap his foot on the Bible to swoop things and, and to tap on his phone and all that stuff, it was just so incredibly powerful. We drove away from that, and I asked my kids, what do you remember most about Nick's story? And this is my daughter. She said, I just remember he didn't have any arms and legs, and he felt bad. And I said, 
baby, did that hold him back? And she said, no. No, dad, it didn't. I said, isn't that crazy? We think sometimes some things are going to limit us, but, but they're not going to limit us. God can do anything, right? And she's like, yeah. I said, Jaden, what, what, was, what did you remember most? And he said, I was surprised that he said that he hated God. But then I, this is in the back seat of the car, but he said, but I kind of understood because he was born without arms or legs. Like, I, I, get, I, I get that. And I said, Jaden, why did that stand out? And it's like the simple things that are like hitting my kids. He says, because it's, it's hard to, to sometimes believe that God is good even when bad stuff happens. This kid's eight. I think he's smarter than me. That's a problem. You can take that picture. Yeah, you already did. Thanks. You're on top of it. <laughs> One thing that stood out to me was this, and, and we'll close our service this morning, is that Nick, he said, you know, I, I, I pray, and I don't know if he said I pray every day or he said I pray often. We'll just stick with often. He says, I pray often that God would give me arms and legs. God has used Nick's prayers to heal physically other people. And he's open about saying, I don't understand fully why that is. He says, I actually have a pair of shoes in my closet. He says, I have them there to remind me to pray for God to provide for me. But he says this, and this is what's so powerful. He says, but even though I pray every single day, or I pray often that God would give me arms and legs, here's what I know fundamentally, is that if God gave me arms, arms and legs don't give me peace. His words, not mine. Arms and legs don't give me peace and they don't give me joy. If Jesus isn't enough for me now, he won't be enough if I had arms and legs later. Family, it doesn't erase the complexity of what needs to go into his everyday life to, to, to just simply live. But doesn't that keep it so simple? So simple that if Jesus is in his life, that that is enough. And then he jokes, he says, because at the end of the day, I'm going to get great new arms and legs in heaven anyway. But now Jesus is either enough or he's not, and for me, Jesus is enough. Family, I want us to decide, to make a determination about what matters and to simply decide to live like it. I want us to be encouraged and to have hope. Why don't we stand and why don't we pray this morning as we close our service?